The question I have for you is how do you address the resources, get the resources to the alternative treatments of pain that are so critical and that would allow doctors in both rural and other areas alternatives to just prescribing only narcotics as the only treatment of pain? And you highlighted some of those, and these are all well known. They're physical therapy, they're cognitive behavioral therapy, they're multidisciplinary pain clinics that you can use to prevent the need to prescribe all these narcotics. Can you comment on that, please? Sure. So, first of all, th thank you for the work you do as, as a pain specialist also. I know it's not an easy field to be in, and we need more people like you, so I appreciate what, your contributions. The point you make is good, and, and it's one that we appreciate, which is that prevention is always better than cure. The thing is, that's a common sense thing. People know that. But it's actually not how we have historically operated as a country when it comes to health. If you look at where the majority of our investment as a country has been, it's been on the treatment side you know, for decades. And so part of the larger issue, even beyond opioids, that we, uh, that we have to take on is how to shift our country to more of a prevention mindset uh, from solely a, a treatment mindset. But when it comes to this epidemic, you know, the prevention piece is part of the reason why in the campaign that we, that we have launched, the Turn the Tide campaign, we are actually focusing on working with prescribers to help change prescribing practices from the outset so that people are not uh, putting uh, patients inadvertently at risk uh, for developing addiction. The issue around, uh, around access to non-opioid alternatives is a real one. And it's a common thing I hear as I, as I travel around the country is, that people, hospital administrators, doctors, and even patients say, look, we want to use some of this stuff. And sometimes we can get it, and other times we can't. Sometimes it's because it's too expensive. Sometimes it's because it, you know, it takes too much time. Like, if you think about it, writing a prescription for oxycodone for 30 days, it might take a doctor maybe a minute in the clinic. The patient goes and fills it. They might pay a copay once, uh, and then they have a 30-day script. If you recommend physical therapy three times a week instead, that's more time, it's more co-pays, it's more of an investment. And so there are other barriers as well, but the coverage piece is important, which is why it's so important that we enroll people who are eligible for coverage under, under the ACA. It's why Medicaid expansion is so important, but it's also why it's important that we work with payers, with insurance companies, to ensure they are prioritizing pain treatments that are non-opioid based. And this is, you know, last year, actually, the, the White House, the Office of National Drug Control Policy, uh, in particular, convened uh, payers to talk to them about the importance of expanding uh, coverage to, and, and you know, to include these alternatives and to ensure that the reimbursement was adequate. Because covering it is not enough. Uh, I had a hospital uh, executive in Oklahoma City who told me that they're trying to use IV Tylenol more uh, than using uh, opioids, but it's almost a tenfold difference in price. And that's, that's really tough uh, for them to absorb. So we have to make it easier to do the right thing. But it's not only the federal government that can work with these payers. What we're finding is that at a state level, Medicaid programs uh, can work with payers. At a, at a city and, and, and local level as well, hospital systems, uh, especially larger ones that have market power, uh, can be a force uh, for working with, uh, with payers. And finally, individual clinicians have much more power than they think. Uh, and I say this as a, a clinician who you know, looked at my colleagues around in 2008 when there was a lot of discussion around healthcare reform and the presidential elections. And I saw all this excitement in the country around the possibility of healthcare reform. But I'd look at my colleagues and I saw pessimism and despondence. And it was because many people in society look at doctors as people who have a lot of power and influence. But strangely, many doctors look at themselves as people who are disempowered, who are beaten down. And they would ask, tell me all the time, no one wants to listen to what I have to say. They're going to listen to like big pharma companies and hospitals. They're not going to listen to the little guys like us who are on the front lines. But I want to tell you that, uh, that your voice really does make a difference, especially with, with elected leaders. I had one member of Congress who once told me, he said, we get a lot of constituent calls. If we get a call from, one call from a doctor in a given day, that's written as a notable event. If we get 10 calls from doctors in a given day, that's a full-blown blown crisis. And it just goes to show like, actually how little our profession actually uses their voice to, to speak up, especially with our elected leaders. But I think we could make a big difference there. Just to add to that, there's a facility and a personnel issue with this, with your question. And that, I think, challenges government to think of creative ways to use the tools we have and the resources we have in a creative way. For example, potentially making grants and loans uh, to communities somewhat conditioned upon an evaluation of whether or not they have adequate personnel, whether they have adequate facilities. Uh, 
basically looking at our, uh, our AmeriCorps, our student loan uh, forgiveness programs, ways in which we could potentially incent people to think about a career in an area that they wouldn't necessarily think of initially because they're concerned about paying off that student loan, they're concerned about uh, a decent life, uh, ways in which we can use the government programs to incent and direct folks into this uh, is another way of doing it. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we're, we're now using our housing programs to help drug courts. Nobody would have ever, ever thought of that except that we were in a drug court and someone said we can't find a place for these people to live.